Yeah, good to see you. Peter, good to see you, genuinely. I know. Um, we should tell people because uh, some people won't know this. We did an interview in person back in 2018. Uh, the podcast hadn't even been going a year. It was just me. There was no team. And uh, we've done a couple since. But uh, you've been a bit quiet last year or two. Missed you. Yeah. I even like made my account private for like a year, I think. Yeah, my Bitcoin and my Twitter account. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely been quiet. And... Uh, I'm enjoying kind of coming back. Like I've been more, you know, doing more podcasts and uh, just more, just more Bitcoin stuff. Yeah. Well, it's good to see you back because uh, mm. you were definitely missed. Did you actually, did you do that Nirvana thing you told me about? You're going to write something about Nirvana. I still have my, I have like, yeah, lots of drawers with drafts in them. And like, that's, that's one of them. Yeah. Kurt Cobain drafts, like a kind of biographical piece. Yeah. Well, I'd, mm. I'd like to see that. Okay, so when we were coming out here to make a podcast, uh, Danny said we need to talk to Tua. It's been a while, so we reached out to you. Not sure what we were going to talk about. We thought we might revisit the Reformation, uh, but you came back to me and said, no, I've got something else I want to talk to you about, <laughs> which means we might not talk about Bitcoin too much today. Maybe we'll We'll see if it comes up. But it's um, it's something I, when you raised it, both me and Danny were like, let's definitely talk about that. It's, we think it's super interesting. Mm -hmm. There are, when we get in it, people understand, but there are, uh, it has a meaning to me in terms of producing content and understanding the influence people have on other mm. people. So, uh, but I, I come with no questions because I think this is just a conversation for us to have. So do you, do you want to give me the background of what it is you want to talk about? Yeah, sure. And it's, it's kind of interesting how this like number seven keeps coming back. So it's, and, and I, I know we're like leading up and like, oh, what is it? But like. It's basically been seven years that I don't that I'm not involved with that anymore, and so I remember th there was this, you know, when you go to therapy, like the idea is that the therapist, it's a bit of an unequal relationship, like they're kind of in a power, you know, dynamic. So if you ever want to be like regular friends with a therapist, genuinely they recommend to like wait seven years, and then like you know then things are and so interestingly like it's been seven years for me and like now i feel like i feel kind of ready to talk about it and i think it's relevant to what well, we'll get into it i'm sure to to what's to some of what's going on on the internet and and even with with crypto but so yeah the 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 short of it is that i was involved in an online cult i think it's fair to call it that way we can maybe go into you know what makes up a cult or things like that and the 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 time frame was approximately 2008-9, yeah, let's say 2009 through to 20, 2014, like early 2015 maybe. Um, so yeah, that's about six years. Um, and uh, it's not like I lived in a commune and things like that, um, but it was really involved and like a lot of my friends were involved with that too. And uh, yeah, it was very you know, very, very toxic and um, confusing. And it took me a long time to like figure out what was going on and, um, and, uh, and leave, you know? Well, I think, uh, mm. I think a lot of people listening right now are going to be thinking, well, what is this? You joined a cult in 2008, 2009, left in 2004. Is this Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the time frame. No, no, it was totally not. Um, no, it was, it was, um, 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 I guess uh, it's hard to say. I guess you could say the cult was named or the community was named uh, or the project was named Free Domain Radio. I think a lot of the early Bitcoiners will be familiar. Um, the guy who ran it is Stefan Molyneux. Um, he um, started it in 2005. And it's, it's real interesting because I forget when he's born exactly, but I remember calculating that he was about 36 years old when he started it, which is kind of like the same age that I have now. And so it's really interesting to look back from that angle too. And so, you know, on the face of it, what he was doing was producing podcasts and um, doing like call-in shows and, um, and talking to a lot of young people. And the angle was like philosophy, like we're going to be, you know, philosophically analyzing what's going on. Uh, with the world, thinking from first principles, like rational debate, that kind of thing. And then ideologically, his bent was very much uh, first kind of like Republican libertarian and then into like kind of anarcho-capitalist. And then interestingly, later, 
um, he made a switch to like um, kind of like um, born again Christian type audiences and also Trump. Like in 2016, he was like a, a Trumper um, even before Trump got elected. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that was what it looked like on the surface. Um, and I, I learned about it because a friend of mine, like he was like, oh, look, here's this, you know, piece that Molyneux had written about that was critical of um, academia. And it was kind of this, now it's more a more familiar story about like, well, you know, the government obviously funds lots of universities. And so you get certain ideologies that are, that permeate the university, especially in Europe and Canada, maybe like to a little bit less in the US because there's more like free market forces at work. And so he was kind of critical of the academic world and it really spoke to me. And so I was like, oh, like digging into like, oh, what else is this this guy about? And then discovering that he was like, I mean, I don't know, I think he's at like 5,000 podcasts now. Like he was like producing huge amounts of content. Um, and, and a lot of it was just kind of him like, you know, monologues, like long, long monologues, like two, two, three hours sometimes. Um, and so I noticed that he was talking a lot about family stuff. And to me, it was like, whoa, like not only, you know, does he understand economics in a way that I think probably makes sense, but like there's this whole like, you know, self-improvement, like working with trauma and his wife was a therapist. Um, we we discussed that in our first ever interview. Yeah, we actually did talk about family stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, we talked about how I broke from my family. Um, yeah, and so it, it was like, and so I started listening to this podcast just like day in, day out. And it took a long time before I've met the first people that were also listeners. But that's how it started. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm aware mm -hmm. of him. Danny, can you look up, I'm trying to remember, it's either a podcast or a documentary. I think, can you look up Rabbit Hole... The New York Times rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Have you listened to that? Mm -hmm. Was that the one with Stefan Molyneux? There was a guy, they talked about going down the internet rabbit hole and where you can end up. And I'm sure they were talking about a guy went on YouTube and he ended up finding a Stefan Molyneux video. And then he started going down the Stefan Molyneux rabbit hole. And uh, and it's it sounded very toxic when he explained it. I think also Stefan Molyneux has been on Rogan and that's one of the shows that's been removed. Yeah, yeah, he did. I think he did two right. appearances. I think I think they've they've been. Mm. It, it was him in that document in that uh, podcast. I yeah. thought so. I thought so. I mean, so that's all I. That's the only uh, awareness I have of him from Rabbit Hole. But the explanation uh, of what he was doing and the way he was manipulating his audience was was pretty clear in that. Yeah, that's. I haven't seen that, but yeah, I would say his peak was around in terms of popularity. It was around twenty fourteen, fifteen, and then and then sixteen too, but in a different way because it was more about Trump. Um, but in, in the libertarian circles, like twenty fourteen, fifteen, uh, anyone who was browsing online because he was doing so many interviews as well. So he would like interview scientists and and all kinds of people. And he's you know he's incredibly well spoken. So it, it's it's. Um, it's tempting to just, you know, go on the show and he asks you about your work. And, and of course, in the process, he legitimizes his own, you know, his own projects. So you talk about it being a cult, but you start out just listening to his content. And then what, talk to me about starting to meet some people, what, what that meant and how you've kind of found yourself in that cult. Yeah, like I think one of the, and again, I think cults are probably like a spectrum. I'm definitely, I, I, I didn't even like, I've never even read a book about cults. So I'm sure people will be, you know, will have all kinds of things to say about how I classify things. And I, I do think it's probably like a spectrum. I think, you know, when people are somehow emotionally, you know, immature or they just tend to see the world black and white, which I think is how he sees things and like good and evil and, and us versus them. Um, me against the world, that kind of thing. I, th I think those kind of people tend to be susceptible to, you know, either joining a cult or in his case, uh, creating it. So so what it looked like, uh, well, to me, one of the main things that made it more cultish is um, is the the moral angle where it's like, you know, maybe your parents are evil, you know, maybe you know, and, and all kinds of like 
reasonings to justify that. Like, oh, you know, they could have found better resources and done a better job and, and they didn't. And like, so they knowingly, you know, did this and that. And, and his audience was like 20 year old kids, you know, like if like now being that kind of age, like in, in my mid thirties, yeah, if I like, you know, see someone who's 20 years old, like they're, they basically just came out of high school, you know, they're very impressionable. And, and, and if I like pontificate about things and especially like, you know, I could ramble for an hour and like kind of like pull up all kinds of theories that I might've heard. And then, and then I don't, what if I don't credit my sources? And then it's like, I'm a genius. Cause they came up with all these like, you know, mind blowing ideas in the eyes of a 20 year old. So, so, so that's kind of how he, 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 um, made himself the authority. And, and another aspect I think is, is aside from the moralistic stuff is, um, and again, I don't think he's evil, right? I mean, I think he genuinely believes that stuff. Um, but is uh, is being manipulative, right? Is really having a lot of double standards. And, uh, and, and like, for example, one of the things he would do is on the one hand, he would be like, seemingly so like humble. It's like, oh, what do I know? I'm just a guy on the internet. Like, but he would do these, uh, sorry, this is in the context of like, two, three hour long call in shows where like, if you have an issue with your girlfriend or whatever, you would call in and he'd be like your instant therapist. And he would like, of course, immediately know what's going on. And like, kind of like Tony Robbins style almost where it's like, yeah, like I, I have this magic sense that I immediately know what's going on. Um, uh, but so uh, on the one hand, he would be like, well, yeah, I mean, you don't have to do anything. I'm not telling you what to do. Like, what do I know? I'm just some guy on the internet. But then in other times he would just be like, well, I don't know. I've only, I've only done this 20 years, right? I've only been a professional full-time philosopher for, you know, so you, it, all this weird stuff. And then it, it took a long time to figure out like, oh, but like, or like, for example, he would tell people what to do. And then it took, you know, eventually you learn about his biographical timeline. It's like, well, he didn't do that. Right. He's telling people to do all this work or to, you know, um, pursue philosophy as much as you can. Whereas like he first made sure he was comfortable financially before he started doing all this stuff. And now it's still his business. Like he's asking people money. And, you know, so, you know, th those are some of the things I think that stand out. And then the culture that he really um, you know, cultivated, the, the culture that that was um you know, what that show was about and what he was about was also in that manipulative sphere where it's like a lot of psychologizing, like anything you say, I'm going to like interpret like, well, you know, maybe tell me about your, ch I mean, this sounds such a trope, but like, tell me about your childhood and like, oh, like, where does that come from? And like, la, 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 la. And so basically it's a way to never take responsibility for him. Like he can always like hold a mirror in front of someone and be like, well, you know, maybe you're being critical of me because of this stuff that you haven't worked out. Like I'm enlightened, but like, you know, you gotta, and of course, you know, the, sorry, I'm like kind of like going through the, the elements. And, and I think another large element is like isolation, you know, is that like, it's this us against them. Like, you know, they're the muggles, like they're the, the people who are like, you know, s s stupid and they don't study philosophy and we're like the the small circle of like enlightened libertarians who are going to you know change the world and we need to breed to like you know and so you need to find the girlfriend who will you know it's just yeah very very toxic i seem to remember mm -hmm. he asked to come on the show stefan molyneux yeah i don't remember that i seem to remember it yeah i can double check that i'm pretty sure he did and i'm pretty sure it was after that new york rabbit hole and we rejected him Interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna confirm that. Uh, I think you would have been working on the show. Oh, it definitely was when that happened, but I don't remember that. Have, have a look. See if you can find him. Search, search him up in the emails. He would have been on my old email. Ah, uh, okay. I mean, I'll search it on mine, but um, I'm I'm pretty sure he did. Um, the interesting thing is when you talk about age, like twenty rolls, and and how susceptible they are. Because I I remember uh, being twenty. I was at university, and I felt like I was an adult. You know, I'm away from home. I've got a job. I'm going to college and I'm learning. I felt definitely like I, I was an adult. Now as somebody with a 17-year-old son, I realize how he's still a kid. And I don't expect in three years for him to not be a kid. Even though he's classed an adult by society, 
I understand how he's still vulnerable. And I mean, our brains are still developing at that age it, anyway. It's 25, is it? isn't it? 27, I even read. 27. For brain maturity. And th there's some, some studies that suggest that like <laughs> emotional maturity is actually in your 40s. That would make about that would make sense for me. <laughs> Peter's like, yeah, 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 yeah. That that, that, <laughs> that that would make sense for me. I think it's coming. I feel like it's coming closer. <laughs> so, talk to me about the community and how the community worked and how you connected with with other people. Yeah. Um, so the, the the there was an online forum, so there'd be all kinds of threads happening there. Um, that was monitored and curated by you know his. Um, either employees or like volunteers that had been there from the beginning, um, which was interesting because some people got kicked off and that was part of like how it kind of fell apart for me. It was like, why did they kick, got kicked off? Like, you know, uh, basically because they were uh, one guy in particular who was like critical and debating a lot of people um, who was basically, I think, threatening Steph because like he was doing something similar uh, and that's not allowed, of course, you, you know, you can't, you know, you can't challenge the, the leader. Um, so the forum was one thing. Um, they, I'm trying to think, the main kind of place where people gathered and definitely listened to religiously was the call-in shows. Like, I think it was at some point twice a week, two, three hours, uh, maybe longer sometimes, and it would all be recorded. And so a lot of the community members quote unquote would would call in like i have i don't know if there's like torrents circulating still and 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 if there's an archive but i i called in several times to like ask for advice and in hindsight i think he he gave pretty terrible advice Did you find any examples of this calling um yeah i don't know i think i don't know when he stopped it's also like it's hard because you know he kind of had this road up and then he got canceled on YouTube and several platforms. And I think that he just, you just counted too much on external hosting. I don't even know if he has a, an archive of all his stuff, but so, you know, back in, back in the days, you could go back and listen to any podcast that, that he'd done previously. And so it was one of the initiation rights is that you would basically listen to all his podcasts. So people would come in like new you're looking at, you know, and he's at podcast 1300 and, it, you know, people would say like, oh yeah, I'm at 300 now, or I'm like five at 500 now, or, you know, they would like listen to the whole thing. So you're, like, you're almost like downloading his, his complete worldview, you know, at, at that point. And I guess when you're going that deep, you're starting to believe that everything he says is correct, even if he's contradicting himself. Yeah, it really is. Like it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to admit sometimes, but it, it really like it drew me in, you know. And and I would just kind of naturally have, kind of excuses because I didn't want him to, to fall off the pedestal. Um, yeah, no, for sure. Like I remember, especially when, after his first, after his second time, he came on. Well, no, his first time he came on Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan kind of pushed back. Uh, or do, you asked, a, do you want a coffee? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Do you know the Summer Moon coffee? I, uh, I do, yeah. So good. Yeah. So, yeah, he would obviously contradict himself um, and, uh, and, and kind of pretend to have this honest, you know, honest demeanor. And then, but every time he was challenged, he would kind of, slither his way out of it or 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 shut people down like he would really shut listeners down and be like, oh on to the next one um so one of the things that comes to mind was his first appearance on on joe rogan joe was like very friendly and i, I was like was quite impressed and uh, and then i think after it aired some people you know probably sent him sent joe rogan some stuff and he was like oh really like is this guy encouraging people to break from families and so the second time uh steph came on it was like the atmosphere is different and Rogan was really challenging him on some things. And, um, and so I remember being really upset, you know, and that like, and then like Joe Rogan was on some other, you know, on some other TV show and he's like, Oh yeah. Like freedom and radio, like they're all crazy. Like his listeners, like they're all crazy. And, and, uh, yeah, like, I just remember like being like really upset and like, Oh, like, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't understand or, um, so yeah, that kind of you, yeah, you just develop this loyalty, you know. Uh, definitely, I think I, basically what you do, I think, and what a lot of the kids did is like you just kind of 
it's like a parental figure, you know, you just like pro project stuff in, in, into him. Um, I want to double check. Mm. I'm going through now, see if it's, it's, been, it's been taken or see if he's the person that reached out to us. Yeah, I'm sure he did. I'm sure it's when he got canceled. I want to, I want to double oh, check. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I'm like almost certain. Um, I remember his YouTube channel got like canceled. So hello, Peter. I just recently found your podcast. I love it. You have very interesting people who bring a variety of viewpoints. I was introduced to Bitcoin by a philosopher named Stefan Molyneux, who was talking about Bitcoin back in the early days. Would you be interested in having him on so I can help set it up for you? Stefan is very articulate and very good at explaining things to a lay person. Yep. I would be interested in hearing his points of view on Bitcoin and morality, anarcho-capitalism, and the current moral state of monetary systems. Let me know if you're interested and if there's anything I can do to make this happen. I think he would add a lot to the conversation, especially in the realm of morals. And I, I replied, I said, sorry, no. Um, while Stefan makes some interesting points in some areas, many of his opinions are not things I like or agree with. I, th I support his right to free speech, but I have no interest in that on my show. And that was in, see, that was last year. No, I, I'm, see, that was last year. I'm sure he's approached me directly as well. Mm. Um, I'm sure I had a conversation with him. I've got like this kind of memory of it, of it happening. Can I look one more place? I'm trying to remember. He definitely spoke at the Texas Bitcoin conference in 2014. Like he wow. was, he, he, had he kept his wits, he could have been very wealthy by now. Mm. Cause like, I, I remember looking at his Bitcoin addresses, his donation addresses. And, um, I think, uh, if you, Count it all together, over 500 Bitcoin was donated to him. Damn. And uh, and wow. I do remember hearing that they lost access to the wallet at some point. And yeah. When you talk about him being cancelled, that that's I think at the time that he approached or someone on his team did. I don't think it's that one. That might be somebody else. But um, we rejected it just because uh, I just I just, I just didn't like him. <laughs> it was following. Um, if I hadn't seen Rabbit Hole, it might have been one of the ones I said, yeah, okay, I maybe would have watched a video or two and thought, okay, he might be interesting. But after the Rabbit Hole thing, I was just like, no, I'm not going to talk to this guy. And, and I'm glad I didn't. He, he really, to me, comes across as really just a grifter. Yeah, I mean, it's more, more clear to me now. Um, yeah, um, what is, a, is, is the definition of a grifter? Is it somebody who's like opportunistic? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I... For me, a grifter is somebody who has like a YouTube show or a podcast. They don't stand for anything. Right. But they're always trying to find ways to get money out of... I mean, they stand for something, but they're always trying to get money out of their audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a guy who runs London Real. Oh, uh, yeah, I know London mm -hmm. Real. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a bit of a grifter. He, um, <clears throat> he was going to do a thing where he was going to create a free speech platform because he got cancelled from YouTube raised a bunch of money from his audience, never really built it. I need to double check this. Don't want to get sued. I mean, Stefan's grift is working. He's got over a thousand Bitcoin in his donation address. Yeah, yeah. but does he still have access to it? Don't is, know. Is it empty? Uh, no, it's, uh, no. Well, yeah, yeah. We can probably figure when, since when. Oh, no, sorry. It is, it? It's, it's, no, it's, it's still in use. He's sending stuff from it. Oh. So that's the balance. No, that's to, uh, confirm received. Yeah, he, oh. I mean, he could have spent a lot of that when it. I mean, yeah, when, when I think did he this probably start? did. I mean, like he start. Yeah, like in 2011, he was already like so. I think or 12 or something like really early soliciting Bitcoin donations. So is is that his whole revenue model? Is donations? Oh yeah, he would. It's almost like he was like you know people people go to church you know and then the you know churches are private institutions and they're maintained by their audience and so. I'm never going to have ads or advertising on my podcast. You know, I want to keep it clean. And so, yeah, like, you know, what if I charge half a dollar per podcast and then you just figure out how many podcasts you've heard and that's how much you donate. And, and so I think that's part of why he made the switch from, from libertarianism to, uh, to Christians, like a Christian audience, because they're used to that stuff, right? You could just be like, hey, I'm, I'm your new church leader. Why don't you donate to me? And, and just to be fair like, or clear, I don't think it's necessarily terrible to like ask for donations, but I definitely think that the way he would ask and also considering who his audience is, like a lot of these, I, I obviously, there, you know, there's thousands of people. I've only met like a small sample, but like 
most of them are not particularly successful entrepreneurs. They're not, you know, they're just like poor students, you know, poor kids. And so, you know, and then the way he would guilt people into, you know, keeping up with the donations, I, that doesn't sit right with me. Yeah, he, it sounds a bit grifty to mm-hmm. me. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan. I'm not entirely against it, but I'm also not an entire fan of kind of some donations. It depends how it's done. Um, I, I quite like the podcasting stuff where you can stream sats. So I think that's kind of cool. And there's things like mm. Sam Harris's podcast. I think he's the one where you can choose how much you pay. It, it's free if you oh, want it to be free, but you yeah, can choose yeah. how much you pay. And I think some people do that or you can subscribe to podcasts. But that whole kind of like soliciting donations, it never sits right with me in that way. And that's what that's, that's, that's like I say the um, Brian Rose, the L- London Real guy. I, I kind of feel like he does that. And there's some great YouTube videos about that, by the way. You can there's a, there's a guy who goes out. And he's like the grifter hunter, <laughs> and he goes out hunting grifters, <laughs> and then and then he does little videos explaining explaining their whole grift. So what was the kicker to get out when you were like you said earlier? You well, know, like, yeah. I mean, oh, I guess part of the context is also I um. You know, I uh, I met my now wife through you know through that. Like she was a listener too. Oh wow! Yeah, and there was a there was a Europe call. So like um, some listeners would like do Skype calls together, and like that's another part. So we were talking about the forum. Then there's the call-in show, and there are some people who actually physically lived close. Like so, for example, Philadelphia is one of the places where I think early on in 2006 to eight there were maybe like 10 people who kind of like tried to like live together. And of, of course there was drama and it all fell apart. Um, but so there, yeah. Hold so, on. What, so, so a group of Molyneux fans created like the Molyneux Citadel. Citadel. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they they physically lived in the same house, but it was like, you know, close to each other. And, uh, and also like he would, kind of, I remember hearing a call where he was talking to um, one of his close, you know, uh, associates or volunteers who had been there since forever and uh, and Steph like asking like oh what happened in Philly that it fell apart and then basically like being like disgruntled like oh they should have reached out to me and I, I would have fixed it kind of thing it's like like this kind of grandeur sense that you know he, 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 he you know and it's basically admitting like you know my, my audience they're like children and you know they need the father to to uh, keep everyone happy, and and they should have they should have asked. Um, it does sound culty. That kind of en- entitlement, yeah. Um, but so, how did we end up there? Like physically? Oh yeah. So my wife. So so there was a Europe call, um, and so interestingly, we knew some of the same people who were on that call because she was from the U.S. But somehow uh, it interested her, and she would also like uh, participate in that call. Um, we uh, we started talking to each other, and then I. Um, ended up just traveling to the US and just sticking around. Like we, we, we just, you know, fell in love and, uh, and that was like 2014 era. And, um, and so it was a lot, I think through, basically I was starting to kind of get a life, you know, like, you know, like uh, instead of just um, being a keyboard warrior and uh, just in those conversations with her, like uh, things like she would be like, huh, what was that about? Or like, uh, and I remember in particular, there's one podcast that he did. Uh, he would do these video productions, eventually, The Truth About. It was like, the truth about this person, the truth about that person. And it was kind of like an alternative take on their you know, biography, like uh, whatever, Lincoln or just something. And so he did a truth about, uh, what's his name again? Um, Jello. Um, Bill Cosby. <laughs> <Sorry>. Okay. <laughs> he did The Truth About Bill Cosby right, right when the scandal broke. And Coincidentally, or just after? no, no. He he was always after you know views and, and engagement and, okay. and growing his audience. So he he would try to produce something really quickly, um, and so he did this like two hour thing about like oh Bill Cosby biography this and that, and he ended up basically saying like yeah that it was like you know a mixed you know he was a flawed man he did you know he did bad things but he also did many good things and like he supported like education and this kind of stuff and like an and, and I remember like kind of like just it just letting it flow over me but more I was like that's kind of fucked up you know like this guy is like a serial rapist and this this scandal just broke and like you're gonna put out a video like basically being like oh you know this, this is good and bad you know he's 
yeah, you know, too bad that he uh, made some wrong choices. It's it just like, uh, yeah, just increasingly we'd like look more critically at some things that he would put out. Um, well, but the, the, that's what mm-hmm. narcissists and sociopaths do. They layer their bullshit with mm-hmm. being parts of the community or making donations or... I mean, it, it was Epstein who did all the work with the scientific community, right? So th- that's like it's just a that's just a narcissistic tactic. That isn't something where you say, "Oh, he's good and he did some good things." He did some bad things. It's no, no, he did some good things as a shield for his bad things. Right. That's- exactly. And then so so isn't that interesting? That like ooh, like for all his you know amazing wisdom, that Steph did not identify that. Well, maybe it's kind of convenient because that's his modus operandi himself, right? I mean. He has all this like helpful stuff and like talking to child psychologists and like, you know, helping you figure out. And I'm not saying he does this consciously, but he has, you know, at least he had, he did create a big shield to, to be like, oh no, I'm a philosopher. Like I care about the truth, you know, look at all this content, you know, and then like the manipulation stuff is like kind of snuck in there. Do you think part of it also, you're just getting older, you've fallen in love, so you've You've got other distractions and you're starting, you know, maybe you started to realize he's just full of shit. Well, it was also that. Or not needing it. 2014, 15 was also the period for me where I I started to really interface a lot face to face with other listeners. And and like, get and, and so they would have a lot of the vibe of like, which was the culture of, um, we call it, me and my wife, we call it like tinkering under the hood where you're like, like it's it's kind of gross if you think about it. Where like every time you enter in a conversation with someone, they start asking you like, "Oh, well, what about your trauma? And like, what about your childhood?" And like it's like you know they're like yanking over the hood of your car and like start to mess with the engine. You know, it's like, "Oh, I don't know if this is." It's kind of like, dude, like you know, of course, like I care about. Yeah, I've been to therapy for over ten years now. Like I care about that stuff, but you know it gets into manipulative territory if every time that becomes like, because because that's what creates the power dynamic, right? If, if I start to like, I could try and, I'm not gonna do it, but like, you know, I could like try and like ask you like, oh, what about your, you know, d- digging around in your childhood and stuff that then like gradually I'm kind of the, I don't know. It's like, I, I'm, I'm like, and I'm not, do- that's the key also is that I'm not doing it meanwhile, right? It's like, like there's the difference. Like I, I'm the authority because, because our friends there, they had been in therapy for longer than us. So, you know, they were, it's like, that's what, I think that's what happens in cults is that some people just have more power. There's like this hierarchy, do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. hierarchical structure and like the people yep. who've been in it for longer, they have more power, they want it, they want to keep it. And so there's this, uh, and so for a long time, I would feel really, intimidated by everyone like even like talking to staff or like oh wow like they've been in it for some the way maybe some people in bitcoin like feel intimidated by someone who's been in it for a long time like oh you know i i i i don't want to step on anyone's toes or so that i think we were talking about like how it ended you know that to me was like it was like turning the volume to 10 you know going from like a more passive listener and every you know interacting with some people to like, all right, I'm living in Philadelphia. We're like meeting these people uh, very often. Um, and then I, I got into some kind of weird, confusing situation with Steph's number two, like his right-hand man. And uh, and th- that's what, that's that was the, you know, the kind of finale for me. Cause this guy was like acting really weird and cold and it's just so confusing. And I spent so, that's like, cause the whole, the whole, um, philosophy is like oh you got to introspect and you got to work on your stuff and then so i was like i was doing that like writing pages and pages like oh what did i do wrong and and so, and eventually it was like okay i think i have some clarity i don't actually don't think i did any, anything wrong the guy doesn't want to talk to me so all right let's let's call you know the buddha like you know let's have a call with steph and all that he did in that call was being defensive and like trying to blame me and i was like oh he was like maybe you know maybe if you don't if you don't get what you want, maybe you get angry. Like he would just shit like that, you know. It's just and I was just like, what the hell? What is this bullshit? Yeah, and so that was like that's that was the moment where I was like, okay, this is fucked up. Like, and, and it's weird because it took me a little longer than my wife. Like she was done with it before I was. Um, sounds yeah. a, sounds mm. a little bit like Scientology. 
in that you have those layers of groups. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was all. It's all very. In, it's there's no written procedures or anything, and, and but maybe that's how Scientology started, right? They like they kind of. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that much about Scientology, but. Well, it has a hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then also the ostracism, right? Like that was one of the the cultist yep. cultish things as well. Is that like rather than because there's lots of psychologists who are like, sure, like you know, if you're in if you're in a family with lots of trauma and lots of dysfunction, like yeah, it can be really healthy to take a break, right? You just take a break, and it can be a long break, and you know, and then gradually you find your way back. But Steph was very like forever. Right, you just break forever. He had broken with his parents forever. He had encouraged his wife to do the same, and then we would also notice it in inside the freedom and radio circles. There's lots of ostracism there, where like people would just kind of be cast out, not to ever be talked to again, uh, which is kind of sad, you know. I mean, if you if you want to grow into a mature adult, like you know, you you, you revisit you know relationships or and it doesn't mean you sometimes you just lose touch with someone and then you reconnect but it was really encouraged to um you know it's like it's also like if you're not an anarchist that was that was one of the tropes that he would use if you're not an anarchist well then you don't believe in the um non-violence uh how do you call it non-aggression principle. non-aggression principle and so i would do this little game with you it was like well would you support the use of force against me it's like if you're in favor of taxation well let's make it personal you know what if what if um what if i i don't pay the tax like would you support that someone with a gun comes in and drags me to jail you know i don't know if it comes but i know exactly what you're saying so, so they would be like so you're it's like demonize the person who just i don't know maybe for whatever reason they don't believe in anarchy uh, it's like, oh, now all of a sudden they're evil. Like they support the use of like this crazy violence against me. So I, I got to stay away from them. My friends are all anarchists. This is why I mm-hmm. wanted to have this conversation. This is why it interested me so much because uh, some people might have already given up listening because they're like, well, I want to hear about Bitcoin. But um, this really interests me because this has come up recently. So I got into a Twitter discussion with somebody about the state. Uh I am a reluctant statist. I believe in democracy. Mm-hmm. I support democracy. Uh, I'm not an anarcho-capitalist. I'm not a libertarian. I like a lot of the mm-hmm. ideas they have. But every time I game it out uh, and try and imagine society organizing around these rules, it just doesn't work for me. And it came up on Twitter and somebody said to me, let's start with first principles. Do you agree that all coercion is bad? which is a very tricky question to deal with because if I say uh, yes, then I'm, by that, I should therefore be against the state because the state will tax you under the threat of uh, weapons. And if I say no, well, therefore, I'm somebody who believes in coercion. I'm fundamentally evil. Those arguments that start from a point of a very simple first principle, they don't allow you to deal with the nuance. So, for Mm. example course i have to pay tax in the uk i'm okay paying tax i think it's too high i wish it was lower i do wish it was lower i would like it to be a lot lower i sympathize coming having grown up in belgium i, I sympathize so you understand you understand but i'm i'm still okay paying tax and whilst you can define it as being uh tax is theft and you have to pay it under the threat of men with guns I don't feel like there is a threat of men with guns. I just accept that as part of how a society coordinates itself. But the reason I'm interested in this is because of these kind of arguments, because I think they destroy nuance. And I think Mm. nuance is super important. When we make a show tour, it doesn't matter what it is, whether we cover Russia, Ukraine, or we covered COVID, or we cover the state, or we cover climate change, or Bitcoin subjects or asymmetric subjects, I can guarantee you that there are three audiences listening. There's the audience that will disagree and never going to change their mind, the audience that will agree and never will change their mind, and then a group in the middle who are willing to hear open arguments. But my problem is is when you get to the audience who disagree or agree, one or the other, who won't but won't change their mind, is that they're unempathetic for other people's ideas and they will repeat talking points they hear from other people. So a great example will be tomorrow. And this isn't, this isn't an advanced criticism of Alex Epstein. But we've got an interview with him. 
he's written a book called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. I'm not saying he's a cult leader. I think he has made some interesting points. I do think those people concerned about the climate have got some issues wrong. The point I'm trying to make is people who are com- have been com- convinced and are immovable from the point that climate change is a scam will believe everything he says and repeat everything he says without thinking it through. That works vice versa. Those who are highly concerned about the climate will read everything by a climate scientist and repeat it verbatim without challenging it. And we seem to have lost this ability, or some people have lost this ability to think through the idea and accept they may be wrong and end up following the opinions of somebody. And I think that's dangerous. I think people have become their ideas, which is dangerous. I think it's understandable, but dangerous. Like I think it comes... Usually it comes from, you know, you feel unsafe, you feel fear, you, and then it becomes like a shield. Like you join a tribe and, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of hiding behind their shield and, uh, and you can just follow them and they'll protect you and they'll value you. And, and, you know, you know, uh, and, and so, yeah, it's like, it's like joining a team is fun and like even in a company and like you know you're competing and like you know or 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 in sports you know like cheering for a certain team is fun but like but you can't do it everywhere like you know you like in 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 life as an adult like you, there is there is nuance and and there is disagreement and uh and uh and it's it's hard to stand on your own legs right to be like hey i i actually don't fully agree with any human on the planet Right. I mean, that's it's kind of tough to realize so, to kind of grow into that and be like, yeah, I'm just my own person. And 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 but then I think that what what's what's the, you know, the beauty is if you can get to a point where it's like, oh, but that doesn't mean I can't connect with other people. Like we can sit at the table and talk and then be like, oh, he has a different idea about this. Oh, let me think about that. Maybe now I'll disagree. And then later, you know, so, yeah, I agree. It's it's um it doesn't even matter what camp people are in. I think the the scary thing is if people are just tribalists, you know, if people and and to kind of come back to the non non aggression principle, it to to somebody who's impressionable, that is a compelling argument. But the nuance I think can come where it's like, okay, well, let's let's make it because pra- the example given is always like, oh, let's imagine Robinson Cruise on an island, right? And then number, you know, Friday arrives, number two. And and then, you know, you have like, what to say if you have five people there and then three people gang up, gang up against the two others and force them to pay tax, you know, that's like the, so it's like the argument that, you know, tax and slavery are just like the, the two sides of one coin. There's another, uh, and I'm, this is just off the top of my head, but, um, but there's another model uh, which is, possible to think about which is the they call it the hotel model in in like libertarian circles or austrian circles and the idea is basically like um um if if you live in an apartment building or like a um some kind of organization where people live together um you want to make decisions and so you have meetings sometimes and, and so there of course you have your own freedom inside your apartment and 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 but there are certain kind of places where there is some friction and where you talk and you try to figure out. And of course, an apartment building is going to charge for maintaining the lawn and this and that. So I'm not saying I agree with that. And that's the model that we should extrapolate. And that, you know, the social contract is therefore, you know, Rousseau is 100% right. And I'm not saying that, but I'm, I'm just saying like, there is another way to look at this stuff, which is not necessarily like retarded or evil or, you know, it's, it's, it's a fair argument. Well, the the non-aggression principle works if everyone abides by the non-aggression principle and their life circumstances uh, allow them to abide by it. And and we don't have people who are maybe violent or psychopaths or desperate who, for some reason, have to break that principle. I mean, if someone is hungry and they don't have food, if they steal an apple from a cart, have they broken the non-aggression principle? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... I tend to think these these binary black and white positions, which you mentioned earlier, earlier, they don't really allow for understanding of what humans are like. Mm. And when humans are desperate and hungry, 
they will fight and they will defend themselves and they will steal. That that happens. So I believe you have to have a way of coordinating around rules. And if you're going to have rules, they're really going to end up being centralized so you have a way of enforcing them. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean I support the extension of where the state is now. You know, we've gone too far. Things have got a bit mm. crazy. But But I think it's important to start thinking of, rather than looking at a binary decision, start looking at the, the net position of both. If you want a libertarian society, what is the net position on everybody? And if you want government, also what is the net position? What does that mean, net the position? Net, the net position. So, for example, uh, we, we live in a democracy now and we pay high tax. But if, you know, you can maybe have a number of different measures, economic output, um, standard of living, you know, how content people are. If you went to a libertarian society, you would lose some things. So what would you maybe lose? Okay, you would lose taxation, so you have more money but you would have to arrange your own uh, f uh, cover for, uh, if in case you have a fire or if you need support from the police or medical cover. Okay, what about people who can't afford that? Does it ghettoize uh, certain areas? And with that, does it make a more dangerous society? Like what is the net impact of, of these decisions? And I, I think there that's where the debate is. And I think if you start to understand the net impact, you don't really want democracy in its current form. You don't really want a libertarian society. You want some something in the middle. Yeah, I don't. I don't know, and I. I even wonder if. I'm just kind of thinking out loud, but one of the areas that I think is under understood and uh, under appreciated is the area of the production of law. And I don't with law. I don't mean lex, right? I don't mean rules that come from some authority. I don't mean fiat, right? What I mean is order. You know, how, how does order get produced in society? And um and and if you look historically, well, it's it's um a lot of it is mediation, a lot of it is is sitting across from a person you don't agree with and trying to work something out. A lot of it is Maybe even uh, just talking about contractual terms like prevention, right? Uh, an ounce of prevention. Um, so, so, t and then and and pre-agreeing, like how how are we going to mediate this if we run into a conflict? Um, and then, and historically, it helps if people have been living in the same area for uh, a long period of time to kind of have a, a consensus, not about individual like life choices, but about. The meta stuff like what if we disagree what do we do do we like bash each other's head in or do we like sit around the table or and then if we do sit around the table how, how does that work you know and so and so i think part of why um we kind of have grasped on to this idea of the state that the state must take care of it is that and, and i could very much be wrong is that there's been so much um so much change has happened over the past few centuries, like so much technological change, so much migration. And so, and so um, what do you do when there's an influx of people with very different programming? Well, it's, it's, it's tempting to be like, well, maybe this one organization can do a great job. Um, and so, but I, I do think in the long run, there can be a lot of un, unbundling where we, you know, ultimately the state is, 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 is just a corporation, right? It's just a corporation that is, has some privileges and some monopolies. And I think a lot, if not all of that, can be unbundled and doesn't have to be so geographically, you know, uh, bounded. Like uh, if I rent a car with Avis, maybe their headquarters are somewhere in the US, but I can be in Europe and still I can rely on, you know, on their the way of doing things, their legal, their, their lawful, way of doing things. And, and historically there was mercantile law, which is also not bound to geography. It was just the oceans. So, so that to me is, and of course, you know, the role of technology is to, is to make the, the realm of where we even have to have these debates to shrink that. Cause if we, if we use Bitcoin, there's not even a debate about how much money there needs to be printed. It just is. We can just like, there's, all that energy about like monitoring the Fed, we can just like not do that and debating each other and, and you know, trying to get elected to make change. Like you, it's just a given. It's just technology takes care of it. So we can focus on on our own private lives and getting along. And, and so that to me is what excites me. It's like, I'm into tech because it shrinks the area of potential conflict. And, uh, and I do think that governments can play a role in shrinking that, uh, that area of potential conflicts, 
Um, but I think there are other ways to to do, you know, there's ways to shrink the government almost completely. Um, and I also, I do, I do also think that there is, like, this is something that I think in general Brits, and I, I don't mean it as like a kind of an attack or something, but I think maybe because of the kind of, um, I don't know, like Jeremy Bentham and like this kind of background of like science, scientism and, and like empiricism, there is a, there, there can be a tendency to like uh, have this consequentialist thinking where it's like something is good if it, if the consequences are good, you know, the end, uh, if we reach the end, then that justifies the means. And to me, that is kind of dangerous. Has any part of what happened with uh, Stefan Molyneux and you're thinking about it and reviewing it, how do you compare that to the, the world of Bitcoin? Because again, the reason I care is, is I believe in Bitcoin like yourself. I think it's a great technology and a great, great tool for people, uh, especially in the current climate. I do consider how we tell the story of Bitcoin to people, how we convince people, help them understand the benefits of Bitcoin, specifically those who may be more moderate on the left, because I think the right and the libertarians kind of get Bitcoin a little bit easier. And so rather than reject them and just tell, tell them their ideas are idiotic, I'm much more interested in, in thinking how we communicate, communicate it to them. Um, but that's a challenge. That really is like a big challenge and something I think about a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you layer on your experiences onto Bitcoin and recognize any faults or mistakes or concerns within the Bitcoin oh, community? Yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, to me, the the concern, I have different concerns now than I had a few years ago. Like in 2015, 16, I was worried about personality cults, not necessarily in Bitcoin, but more in the altcoin space. And I think we've we've seen, you know, Cardano and, and Ethereum, I think to a large extent is, is a personality cult. Um, and that to me is, um, it, you know, because of my background with this stuff and because I know how destructive it can be to like, I think just in general in life, like the most painful things is to like let go of your illusions. Like that, that is one of the most painful things. And so if people get really caught up in one of those altcoin personality cults, it's going to be really painful once the downfall happens. And so that's part of why I've been always so vocal to, to be critical, you know, of, of these kind of things. And then as time progresses, um, I think, I think Bitcoin is winning and, uh, and I think Bitcoin is going mainstream. And as that happens, I think there are certain people feel like they may lose their edge, right? You used to be kind of on the cutting edge if you're a Bitcoiner. Well, if a billion people use Bitcoin or five billion, you know, you're just, it's like an internet user. You're just an internet user. Whereas in the nineties, you were like, you know, part of a little club, exclusive club. And so my worry now is that we'll, we'll see splinters, you know, we'll see people that feel the need to have a tribe. And so they will maybe incorporate Bitcoin in, you know, whatever their ideology might be. And, and I just worry because it's just destructive, you know, it's, 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 it's reminds me, or, you know, I've done work on, on the Reformation. Um, and, and so looking back, to me, the, the essence of the Protestant Reformation was we had a technolo technological revolution. We had, you know, printing press was, was one of the main things there. Printing press. And that allowed people to push for religious freedom, which was radically new. Like, we don't need a monopoly on religion. People can just follow their own, you know, passions and interests. And, and it's a personal thing. Um, and so that was the push initially. It's like breaking the monopoly of the Catholic Church. But then if you look at what happened, all these crazy cults started emerging. And that's what we associate today with Protestantism. Like literally, originally it was protesting the Catholic Church. That's what united people. But then as almost everyone started doing that, some people were like, and I would include Luther in that and some other like very famous figures, they created their own cults. And uh and, and I feel like the ideal of the Protestant Reformation, even though it started in Europe, was most perfectly achieved in the U.S., where you, you, you have that, you know, religious freedom. And then gradually it came back to Europe. So that's, that's kind of what I, what I think could happen, you know, and in in, as Bitcoin goes more mainstream, that we just, uh, 
that in a way, and I, I guess I feel compassion too. Like society can't move faster than what it's ready to move towards. So this like Bitcoin nirvana that we dream of might take multiple generations to actually, you know, materialize. It might be, we might have some weird times when people are like, Bitcoin initiation rituals. I don't know what we could expect, but you know, that's, that's one of the things that I try to, and I think that's what you'd try to do too, is like, Hey, like, you know, no, you don't like, you don't, you don't need to eat, you know, meat to be a Bitcoiner. Or you don't need to do all these arbitrary things to, to be part of the club. It's just the technology, you know? So you, so you say you worry about it happening in the future, but I, I see it happening now. And, uh, we were, we were out yesterday talking about this, when somebody who isn't a Bitcoiner can come into the community, have a question, and groups of people can dogpile in, call them an idiot, meme them, insult them. And I think that pushes them away. Someone who doesn't do that is Michael Saylor. He's brilliant. Yeah. Every time he replies mm -hmm. is with a very considered, intelligent explanation. But that's lost amongst people dogpiling in. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, I'm a hypocrite. I've done it. <laughs> I try not to. But, but I do worry that actually that holds Bitcoin back. Uh, I worry as from people externally looking in, do we look like a cult? I mean, we make a joke about it. Some people even say, hey, I'm in the I'm in the Bitcoin cult and I'm glad. Mm. But I do worry we look like a cult. I don't think it's that uniform. Like, I mean, first of all, on the one, like I really cause I I because I, I feel like I've 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 been through it with with everyone else. You know, if you've lived through the big several Bitcoin cycles. Uh, you have battle scars. If you, you know, if if you believe in fundamental analysis and long-term thinking and like sound engineering, you feel the battle scars of all the attacks that have happened against Bitcoin. And so I, I really, really, really sympathize with the cause, like kind of like the motivation of where some of these people are coming from. Like, hey, like another person who is justifying shitcoinism or whatever like I, I get that there's an there's an element to that that's just like an immune system response and that there's a healthy you know i think that's healthy right and so but th then there's a gray zone where it's like whoa does that justify abuse you know it's it's kind of like recent just a few days ago we had will smith's like slapping um this um uh, chris rock this comedian at the at the oscars and it's like yeah you can sympathize where will smith may be coming from like you know he had uh, horrible violence growing up in his his family, and uh, and and maybe he has some marital troubles and whatever. You can like sympathize, but it's still wrong what he did. And so I feel the same way about people piling in online with all kinds of abuse. It's like, well, I sympathize where you're coming from, but that doesn't justify uh, hazing someone or you know whatever you call it, bullying someone. Well, that's the that's the shame of social media. Uh, I remember well, MySpace was my first one. Which, oh yeah, yeah. But there wasn't really social media. I just would go on band pages and listen to their music. And but uh, Facebook was really the first social media tool I used. Yeah. And it was great fun. It it was great fun to begin with. You'd go out, someone would post some pictures. You'd laugh about what happened the night before. You would throw a sheep at each other. You would have fun. It was great. And then remember, I remember Twitter coming along and thinking, no one's going to use this because you don't know it. You don't know these people. Mm. You, you don't care what they say. You, so I didn't really use it to begin with. I kind of stuck with Facebook. And then what happened was I started, Facebook got boring, and Twitter became useful. But now Twitter has got to this point where it is just a big, giant argument, a big, well, giant fight. And, and didn't people also like, like really go out of your their way to hurt you like recently? Yeah, I mean, that happens, but mm -hmm. that's happened the whole way. And, and, you know, I'm not completely without blame. Mm -hmm. I've... I control and I can take the mick and yes, there's abuse that comes in. I mean, there was just, there was one particular thing that's happened a couple of times, just the uh, insulting my dead mother. Yeah. yeah some, I, actually, it was to my sister. Some guy said, I'm, oh, I'm right. glad, I'm glad, everyone's glad she died. Actually, those are the ones, like it's a, re, it's, it's just another reason to just say, I don't care about Twitter, but also they are the ones that, that affect me the least, surprisingly, because this is just some random guy who's obviously mentally deranged and, you know, hurting himself in some way that he feels it's okay to say that to somebody. So yeah. that, you know, that doesn't bother me the most in the end. Uh, the stuff, I, you know, the stuff I dislike the most is where some people who should know better, uh, they, they lie about your intentions. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, you know, they, I think that rubs me the most too. Like yeah. it's under my skin where someone who has built up a certain credibility for themselves and still, and, and, but still they're like insidious and insinuating that you, that they're basically superior, morally superior. And, 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 and to me, what, what gets me the most is this, like that other people don't see what's going on. Right. Well, like they're, 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 they're in the sub cult. Well, yeah, right. I mean, yeah, this person is kind of a cult, mini cult leader, and then their followers are like, yeah, yeah, you know, that that is what gets me, you know, the most. Where it's like, all right, I'm gonna take a break, or ugh. Well, I've I've I've, I've taken the break. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's made my life immeasurably better over the last week or so. Um, but I, I took the I took the main reason I took the break is. Um, I was being a dick myself. I, some guy was making a comment, mm. and the way I questioned him is not the way I would have done it in person. Yeah. But I would yeah, said, yeah. listen, I, can you explain this to me? I, I really don't understand why you're doing this. Instead, I was like, it was a bit of sarcastic quip, and then he came back to me and I said, you know what? You've just given me a good reason to quit to it. And so it was mainly self-reflection yeah. uh, of my own behavior, but but I can layer in loads of re- I can give you 20 reasons to quit Twitter. Mm. In the end, it just doesn't serve a purpose for, for me anymore. But I also feel like it's um, it's one of those things that, what, what was it Amber said to me one time? Everything's a, a weapon if you point it in the right way. And I feel like people have weaponized Twitter against mm-hmm. each other. And I'm just like, I don't need this. This isn't helpful. Yeah. So but I still see it as a, a useful tool for a number of reasons. But I do feel like, I, I, I do feel like with these social tools, we've lost civility and the, the ability to have a proper discussion. And it's gamed in a way where it's fight, fight, fight. And I'm just done with that. Yeah. And I mean, also, it like the, the, the power that it has to, um, like kind of it, like it can like play your emotions like a piano, you know, you're like going through scrolling through the feed and like you're seeing all this stuff. And I mean now, especially with the wars and stuff, like so, it's like you're you're bombarded with all these impressions, and uh, and and the responses are often even on your own tweets. Like if I look at the responses, like I know people just did it in like ten seconds, like do do do. Not everyone, but you know, a lot of people just, which is understandable. It's so easy, uh, and part of how Twitter thrives is on the engagement. It's like oh yeah, if you're like a little bit sarcastic, then you know you got a, a thing going. Um, it so also I, elevates it elevates people to in, into a position they're not ready to handle. You got to think f- five years ago too. I didn't have a podcast. I was just a guy with a regular job. I do a podcast. And I've got half a million followers. I'm not prepared for that. What that means or how to handle it. Yeah. How I use that responsibly. I'm just not prepared, and and I recognize that now. Uh, I recognize that I can say things that if I get things wrong, there's a negative impact, and and. I don't know how you prepare for that, but it's similar. I mean, it might even be someone who's got 10,000 followers and they're a troll and they spark that, you know, the people who follow them to attack someone with them. And, and I just don't think people fully, you know, can understand the impact that they can have on other people. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I, I guess it's just like, it's funny how in the Bitcoin world, we're always talking about like low time preference, lower your time preference and like think about the long run and like, you know, hodl and all that stuff. And yet we're all engaging, not all, but like, because I know there's there's lots of Bitcoiners who don't do social media. Yep. Um, but, you know, we're all engaging in this super short time preference platform where it's just like do, do, do. And, and so there's kind of like an irony. Uh, there's kind of an irony in there. And, and I'm, I'm guilty of it very much. Not guilty. I don't think it's bad, but it's like I'm I'm aware of the the challenge. I feel like my challenge is to kind of like lower my type of reference more so that I I can you give Twitter a more like you know kind of like okay, I like you. Here's your room. Like this is you know I'm gonna visit the room every now and then, but it's not like sitting on my shoulder, following me everywhere. Like that's I don't want that. Like I, I wanted to have. To be some like a tool for me, rather than something that like rules my life. Um, yeah, I, I can understand that. I, I feel similar, but also a, t- a tool for Bitcoin. So the way we're just using it now is we release release a show and we'll retweet yeah. it. Uh, somebody said to me, "Will I ever come back on Twitter?" And I was like, "Well, probably at some point. I don't know." But there are still some tweets I will send. So, for example, say you wrote a new article, and I was like, "This is great. I will share that out." Mm-hmm. Or um, 
we're about to support a, a, a project, a charity project, and we're going to make a Bitcoin donation to try and spark other people. I will tweet that out. Yep. These are useful things. But but as far as get in there and have opinions and share opinions and debate them, that mm. time has passed. Yeah. And, and now uh, we use this. This yeah. is the place to do it, where like two it. people can have a conversation. We can put it out there. People can email us and they can give us their feedback. And I think that's a much better use of time because in the end it's – What's, what's the thing? What, what's best for Bitcoin, Danny? Everything's good for Bitcoin. <laughs> no, but that, that, but that was a point. Like, is is yeah. If if the decisions we make are good for Bitcoin, then they're the right decisions. Let, let's do that. Let's put Bitcoin first. We want we want Bitcoin to be a success. We know the benefits that can have on people's lives. So let's just focus on that. Let's make shows like let's make this show to help people understand, and hopefully. This will impact people in a way so maybe they don't dogpile and attack other people or think or have empathy for other people's decisions. They might tell me to go fuck myself and think I'm pretentious, but they might, someone might come out of this and go, you know what? Maybe I'm not going to talk to somebody like that online. And maybe I'm going to look at how Sailor replies to people and maybe I'm going to do more of that. Can yeah, we do things like that? Yeah, I, I think that the, you know, so much starts with yourself. And like if you can kind of like just find a way that really works for you where you feel like also kind of, ethically more at peace, then the side effect is you become a role model, right? And you just, you, people kind of sense that like, oh, this person is happy and, and they're not abusive. And 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 because that, that's part of what I, I find not very productive is these like debates on Twitter about how, to, how people should behave. It's kind of like, I understand maybe where it's coming from, but it's not usually not productive. Like it's just, you know, um, but something I was meant to, meant to ask you, because you started bringing it up, that one of the things you're trying to do is to kind of reach across the aisle and like kind of, yeah. you know, um, see people that are more liberally inclined. Uh, what are the things that can can help them join us, you know, join, join Bitcoin? Um, and by the way, I wouldn't call myself Republican at all. Like, you know, I'm, I'm very much like kind of politically homeless. Um, but so I'm curious, what are the things you feel like you've found so far that that possibly really work? Well, so this is this has been coming for a while. The 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 real standout thing for mm. us is uh, we took it off recently. But I used to say in every show, if you want to get in touch, drop me an email. Hello at whatbitcoindid.com. I reply to everybody. And we got to a point where we're getting 40, 50 emails a day. Whoa. And it would take me an hour to two hours every morning to reply to them. And I was happy to do it. But, but well, no, I was happy to do it to, be, to begin with. When it became one to two hours, that became prohibitive in terms of time. And especially some people send you really long emails and you want to respect them and read it. So we took, we took that out. But what was happening is the response I was getting in my emails was very different to Twitter. So Twitter, you know, I have differing views than maybe some of the more uh, some of the more traditional Bitcoiners. Uh, I, I vocally say I am a firm supporter of democracy, which isn't a popular term amongst certain circles. Mm. I will say I, I'm i vaccinated. I will say I um, I think climate change is caused by humans and I'm concerned about it. To some people, I'm considered a lefty. That I'm still I'm still considered by the right of the UK, but for some people, I'm considered a lefty. But I will share these opinions. But what will happen is... On Twitter, the response generally was kind of either neutral to neutral to fuck you. And the fuck yous are memes and, you know, people making memes of me and, fo uh, and, and putting me in outfits and saying I'm an idiot and then blocking me and accusing me of being a, a cock and all this stuff. It's quite aggressive, aggressive responses to it. But what would happen in the emails, the emails we would get in would be like, thank you for speaking up about this. Thank you for that. I really appreciated it. I share your opinions. And I was like, okay, there is there is a difference here between the listeners and Twitter. And why is that? And I think what it is, is the public uh, acknowledgement of agreeing or supporting ideas is not rewarded. It's actually attacked. Because it's not the, it's not the considered historical uh, position for some Bitcoiners. And oh, actually, also some people would specifically say to me, "I'm not going to say this on Twitter because I don't want to get attacked." Yeah, right. So th that was something that really stood out for us, um, and it didn't really change too much about what we do because we would always speak to everyone. But what the one thing we have noticed recently, there's more people who are moderates left who are asking to come on the show, and that didn't happen historically. It was uh, traditional kind of Bitcoin people who are who don't give a fuck about politics or 
are libertarians, anarcho-capitalists, maybe on the right. We just didn't get people from the left. That's now coming in as well. Oh, that's awesome. And, and the bigger point here really is, is Bitcoin is going to spread amongst the wider world quicker than Bitcoin is going to bring down the state. That's very clear. So yeah. if, that, if that's going to happen, there's going to be an influx of people who are from the right, the left, and the middle. So what can we do as best, what's the best thing we can do with this show is represent the spectrum of voices that exist out there. Because if we, if we only represent one cohort, then it might feel like a cult. It might feel like you don't belong here. Yeah. We want people to listen to the show and say, whatever your opinion is, wherever you sit politically, there, there is a show for you. Mm. And then by the way, even if you're from the right, listen to the people on the left. And if you're from the left, listen to the people from the right and make an effort to empathize with where they've come from. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but absolutely. Would you say that's fair, Danny? Yeah, definitely, for sure. Yeah, and, and um, what um, what it kind of makes me feel excited about is to do some more things outside of the Twitter sphere because it really resonates what you're saying, that there's a lot of people who maybe they are on Twitter and lurking or something uh, or some maybe they just listen to podcasts or something who, yeah, just don't feel, sa- understandably, don't feel safe being the minority. Like whatever angle you're coming from, like it's scary on Twitter to have like a minority opinion and to share it. And, and then potentially be bombarded uh, with with uh, abuse. You know that's just not cool. I think it's also the biggest shame of this is is that we should be embracing alternative views. Like I, Alex Epstein tomorrow, the interview with him. That's somebody with who I I fundamentally disagree with. But by embracing what he says and listening to it, I've actually shifted my position on certain issues to do with climate change because I'm I recognize the things I agree with him on rather than just saying no it's all bullshit I'm not going to talk right. to you and that's allowed me to go to a more nuanced position on understanding climate change what can be done what shouldn't be done and that and and because basically we don't have to get into that issue itself but there are on the two exp- uh, spectrums you've got the climate hysterics and then on the other spectrum you've got the burn the coal people and actually the problem we're dealing here with climate change is that we need to be able to burn, we need to create energy. Right now, we need to burn fossil fuels. Stop Stopping that um, presents a risk to society because we may have power blackouts. But also at the same time, we are seeing the effects of climate change. So by try, for me coming from a climate change, somebody concerned about that, but trying to understand his position, I can walk that nuance and, and, and try and navigate that and try and understand what the bigger problem is. Now, I'm not going to, come up with an answer that's going to change anyone's opinion but what i might do is bring the guests on that help people understand this yeah it reminds me of something i, I remember from like there's a lot of shades and hues in, in the libertarian world but there are sub you know sub units or whatever you call it um sub tribes um of people who use it as a shield they're like it's like a shortcut for not having to talk to anyone for basically an excuse to be an asshole. It's like, you know, this philosophy is gonna, if everyone kind of follows it, we don't we don't have to do this weird thing where we sit around the table and talk to people that we disagree with. And I, I feel like I see it in Bitcoin too, where some people think, oh, Bitcoin is gonna solve the world's problems, so I can just be a dick. You know, it's 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 tempting and it's and it's they're like it's 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 they just avoid the discomfort of like talking to someone who, yeah, like disagrees, maybe even about some really big stuff, you know, it's, it's hard. And so I think I, I really, uh, you know, I think it's awesome what you're doing with the show, you know, and, and like, you know, you. to your point about, yeah, the climate change thing. And, uh, it seems like the gender stuff is, it's, they're so like mired with tribalism on both sides. It's, um, I don't know. I don't know always about on both sides, but like there's definitely they're so sensitive these issues. Um, yeah, and, and they're never normally black or white. No, no, no. Like I, I think I've also like grown into a more nuanced. I've gone back and forth like with the climate change. I've gone to like both sides. Uh, there were times where I was like, oh my god, like you know this, this is really happening. And then times where I was like no, I don't think the earth is warming. And then like, I think I'm more like in the middle now where I do think, and and who am I, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about this stuff, but, but 
uh, I do think the earth, the, the, you know, industrialization, the fact that we pushed a lot of um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere has contributed and is contributing to the warming. Um, and then on the other hand, I think it's, I don't think politics can stop it. I think that oh. that's a kind of hubris to think that we can just, the UN can get together and do like a global you know program and carbon taxes and boom, boom, boom. And like, we stop the clock at five minutes to 12. Like, no, it's just going to play itself out. It's going to be like a carbon burp where, you know, they have models where they're like, okay, what would happen if we would uh, incinerate all the carbon inside the Earth's crust at the same time? What would happen to the climate? And there is some, you know, apparently some, there were times when the Earth was on fire pretty much for hundreds and thousands of years. And so you can kind of see what it did with the, you know, with the temperatures. And, and so it seems like if you just let it play out, yes, temperatures will be higher for a long period of time, but they will be stable higher. Like they just, you know, it's like, it's not gonna grow exponentially. There's a, there's a, seems to be a ceiling. And so I guess I feel like the most productive thing to do from my point of view is more like the entrepreneurial angle where it's like, okay, maybe let's just accept the earth is gonna get warmer. Some places are gonna get uncomfortable to live. We're gonna be able to have British wine again, like in the Roman times, you know. Like, I, actually, <laughs> in Belgium, there's like there's Belgian wine again. Is that's, there? That wasn't the case in my childhood. Like, yeah, we have good sparkling wine in the UK. Well, I mean, so so you know, and and we can like start to live in Greenland again. So I mean, it cannot be that there's only negative consequences to global warming. And like for one, in terms of like talking about nuance, I'm very happy that we have the problem of global warming rather than like imagine if we were like declining into a new ice age holy hell, we have like 9 billion people that we got to keep warm. That's a lot, that seems to be a lot harder to do than, you know, we're sweating and we need to make sure everyone has enough water. Like our, our bodies are kind of created to deal with heat more than with, with cold. So anyway. I no, just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of similar. I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer. I certainly think we are warming the planet and I certainly mm. think that is going to have an impact in different places in the world in different ways. Sadly, the poorest nations are most likely to be the most effective. effective. Yeah, you mean like Africa, for example? Certain places in Africa, Indonesia, uh, from our research, and also coast, you know, coastal cities and islands and such. Yep. And the people who are most economically equipped to prepare for this are the most uh, e economically advantageous nations. Um, do I wish there was a way of solving it? Yes. Do I think we can as humans? No, I think we're too greedy. I think we've gone too far. Mm. Can we slow it down perhaps? I, I mean, this this is like a really evolving position I have. Um, but I've only been able to get there by speaking to a wide range of people from Catherine Hayhoe, who's a climate scientist, to Alex Epstein tomorrow, and to try and get myself to fully understanding mm. the big picture. Right. And that's why I think it's important to talk to as many people as possible so you get as much information as you can to come to your kind of conclusions. And then if you feel like you have an educated uh, point of view to make across, at least you can come with that nuance. And and perhaps people will trust you more because they're like, well, he will speak to everyone. He doesn't fall right. into a cult. He will apologize when he's wrong. He'll admit his mistakes. If you can tr create trust because of the way you operate, then hopefully you can, when you come to conclusions, people will listen to them more. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And also, I mean, for me, this kind of research is like, it's from my, my own peace of mind. Like, you know, because yeah. I want to feel good about the choices I make in my life and and um, and so rather than like push it away and be like, oh, I'm just not going to think about that. Like this is one of the issues where I have spent some time like, you know, reading and thinking. And I'm really glad that there's there's these conversations happening, too. So uh, what's, what's the future for you now then, too? Well, um, I'm kind of. I'm kind of taking it easy. I, I, I mean, to kind of like make it full circle, I um I, the first time we talked, we talked briefly about that I had broken from my family. Well, I saw you recently and you told me you, I mean, I, I actually uh, wrote down here because I was going to ask you, yeah. if you mind me asking you, you said you split from your family. I bump in, mm. bumped into you, why did I bump into you a few months back? Uh, maybe in Austin somewhere. Yeah, it's also like it's outside a bar or something. And you told me, you said, you know, you've rebuilt it with your family. Yeah, I mean, it, it uh, started in late 2019 and then it was obviously hard to see each other physically with the pandemic, but uh, it, it was literally not possible to travel. I even missed uh, two funerals, unfortunately, because I was not allowed to travel. Um, but yeah, it's been, um, 
it's been amazing to like reconnect with everyone. Like I just talked to my cousin this morning um, because I, I just for context, like I had f- fully, I fully cut contact from all my family uh, for about six years. Um, and it was really hard to do. And I did lots of therapy uh, to kind of, you know, figure out what was going on for me, what I needed. And so now it's this like amazing I don't know. It's it's so good. It's better than it's ever been. I did like we put together like a, a little family reunion, which was awesome in in my hometown Bruges. Uh, we're definitely going to do that again. Yeah, it's it's you know so and it's, I guess to me it's like the the history of this cult thing. It's also nuanced. Speak of nuance, because like there were some you know kernels of truth you know in there that I feel like I. I, I, I did something with, you know, the therapy stuff was super helpful. I'm, I still do like lots of therapy, like group and, and like individual and couple. I do lots of therapy still. But so, but so, yeah, like for me, like, you know, being in touch again with my family is amazing. Like I, I'm so happy uh, that that's happening. And um, and then in terms of, you know, uh, I, I, I love Central Texas, like we're going to stay here. Um, and there are some plans brewing. I'm, I'm trying to take it slow. I don't want to rush. Um, I, I did like a Bitcoin fund before. And, but so yeah, in the direction of like long form writing and research, uh, it's been three years that I published something, uh, you know, in terms of article or reports, I don't think it'll be focused on Bitcoin, but I have some things brewing. Like I said, I have like a lot of drawers and there's drafts in there. Um, but I, I want it to be kind of like I wanted to take my time and, and really, you know, find a way to have this marriage between something that's really meaningful to me and potentially of value to other people. That That's always what excites me. Um, and uh, yeah, written, maybe even print it, you know, that, that's, uh, that's what I'm, what I'm working on thinking about. Well, what, whatever it is, I, I want to read it. <laughs> I've always enjoyed your work. So, and I think what we'll do, because it's, it's been a couple of years since you've been on the show, uh, some There'll be new people who come into Bitcoin who might not even know who Tio de Mesa is. So we will share out in the show notes the previous shows we made, the articles. Um, I think people should go and dig into them. But thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable, transparent, open. Um, this is a very different show to, that we normally make. I'd be intrigued to see uh, the feedback. But thank you, Tio. It's, uh, it's great to see you again. Yeah, likewise. It was a pleasure. Thank you.